Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. There were several of us who had gotten together for the week, going in on a cabin rental near Blind Bay in British Columbia. From this cabin, we looked out over the bay and Copper Island. We had gone there to catch Kamloops trout, which can range in size up to 20 pounds. This cabin was situated on an elevated parcel of land, so when we were out a fair distance in the bay, we could still see the cabin. At the time, this area was still predominantly wilderness, but evidence of man was starting to show. There was a thriving logging industry and a fair amount of other businesses and things to do in the area. There was a nine-hole golf course and a marina on the lake. We were there in season and there were some other people around as well. We had a boat outbound and were going out every day to fish on the lake. It was Tuesday morning and we were fishing near the shoreline of Copper Island when one of the guys said, hey, there's someone over by the cabin snooping around. Of course, we all turned to look and sure enough, there was someone dressed in all black walking around the side of the cabin. At the time, we gave it no further thought figuring it was a maintenance man or maybe the owner checking something out. When we came back in for lunch, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, and that was that. The following day, we went out for our second round of action in the afternoon and returned with some fish for our dinner. My friend Jack filleted everything on the picnic table and came into the cabin with the rest of us to sit and have a beer before we cooked. We were all sitting around inside the cabin with our feet kicked up and having a good time. About an hour or so later, I said I was going outside to get the grill going. There was a fire pit behind the cabin made of cement blocks with a metal grate on top. The guys were coming out of the cabin and we were all standing by the pit when Jack said, where are the fish? I said to him, what do you mean, where are the fish? He said they were all laying here on the table where I left them. As you would have well imagined, the whole crew was standing there dumbfounded. Jack had hosed down the table after cleaning the fish and left them lined up on top of it, ready to be cooked. Something or someone had taken our fish from the table while we were inside having a beer. We all started thinking about the guy we had seen by the cabin. Maybe he was some local weirdo, sneaking around the cabin of the visitors looking for stuff to steal. We were scratching our heads and looking around when my buddy said, Hey, check this out. He was standing next to the picnic table, pointing to the ground. We could see several large prints in the slop that had run off the table when Jack hosed it down. These were not bear tracks, but we had no idea what they actually belonged to. We had several tape measures that we used to size fish, and one of the guys broke one out to measure the prints. One of them was roughly 22 inches long and 9 inches wide. We could see noticeable toe impressions that were wide and well separated from each other in the mud. Whatever this was had been at the table helping itself to our fish while we were inside the cabin, and it must have been one big son of a bitch, that's for sure. On to the next story. When we were in our early 20s, my friend Rowdy and I went on somewhat of a backpacking binge. We had grown up together in the same neighborhood, 
a redneck area in Meeker, Colorado, and we'd learned to hunt and fish and do everything a good Western Colorado boy learned in those days. So we were pretty adept at taking care of ourselves. I say in those days because this was some 20 years ago and we both grew up and went on to bigger things, although I can't necessarily say better. Rowdy's now a pilot for a major airline and I started a company that makes safety gear for miners. This incident I'm about to relate was what triggered us to get out of town and make something for ourselves, if you would call it that. It definitely put an end to our backpacking. Rowdy and I had one thing in common. We both loved the outdoors. And I don't mean in a sense that would make one want to become a nature writer or photographer, but more in the sense that we wanted to be wild men and never be indoors again in our lives, but instead go live in caves and explore and eat berries and all that. It was the freedom. Of course, it was a romantic notion based on watching TV shows about people like Grizzly Adams and reading about the old-time trappers. Actually, now that I think about it, we were both kind of rebels, and the wilderness represented an escape from convention and society for us. In any case, neither of us amounted to much by society's standards. Rowdy worked at the local gas station, and I did janitorial work when I could get it. It was amazing we'd both even managed to graduate high school. I know Rowdy was kicked out several times for smoking on the school grounds, and I had my share of problems too. But we now lived for the times we could get out, and Rowdy finally bought an old beater pickup, which represented a major turn in things for us as it meant we could finally get out and away. It was early summer when he bought the truck and we both immediately quit our jobs. We planned on spending the entire summer exploring and backpacking. We'd both managed to save a little money and we'd figured we could pull it off, then come back to civilization and get jobs again in the fall, unless by some luck, we figured out a way to just live out there, in the wilds, permanently. I think our parents were hoping for the latter by this time, as they would pretty much had it with us. We had a great time that summer, exploring all over the place, and coming into town to resupply and say hello to our parents so they wouldn't worry too much. The memories we created during that short summer have stuck with me all my life, and I know they're pretty special for Rowdy, too. We basically just went feral and lived like wild men. We had our health and our youth and our wild ideas and all went together into a very special time living out there in our little backpacking tents, hiking all over and finding things we had no idea even existed or things we had no idea existed finding us, I should say. It was late September, and we'd just come back into the high country from town. Our packs topped out with fresh supplies. We knew it might be our last trip as it looked to be an early winter, with fresh snow already hitting the high country, though it had melted. All the outfitters were talking about how business was down as people were thinking it was going to be a short autumn and all the deer and elk would be hightailing it into the low country, far from the hunters. Rowdy and I knew this because my uncle was an outfitter, Lone Joe Outfitting, Northfolk of the White River. When he found out we were going out backpacking again, he warned us to get back within a week. There was a snowstorm brewing in the Arctic that looked like it was going to come down our way. He watched the weather more than most weathermen. He'd also seen all the signs of an early and hard winter. He grew up in the backcountry, and I trusted his knowledge. So for Rowdy and me, it was kind of a poignant time, as we knew it would probably be our last trip, which it was, 
but not for the reasons we thought it would be. We were determined to go out with a bang, though, and planned our last outing as a seven-day backpacking trip across the flat-top mountains not far from Meeker. My uncle told us we were nuts, as these mountains are pretty high in elevation, and he knew it was already freezing up there. But Rowdy and I were seasoned mountain men by then, so we thought. Actually, I don't know what we were thinking. Maybe that if we got snowed in, we'd just end up like the old trappers, sitting around some big fire inside a makeshift teepee with some good-looking Indian girls or something like that. The youth just doesn't know how to worry properly, I guess. And kids like us hadn't had a chance to find out all the things that can go wrong. We were going to start at Trapper's Lake, a beautiful large alpine lake right in the heart of the flat tops. Then, pretty much, hike straight across to the little town of Iampa, which sat on the other side of the mountains. Of course, there were a number of rugged peaks and cliffs that would prevent a straight line traverse, and we knew this, so my uncle had helped us plan out a trek that would take us up and through a number of drainages. The flat tops are named that for a reason. They're a huge mesa, capped with volcanic basalts, which give them their flat top, and also create huge cliffs that ring the tops, making it hard to get through them. So, we stuffed our packs to the gills and headed out, parking the truck at Trapper's Lake Lodge. The owner there knew my uncle well. We would hitch a ride back once we came out in Yampaside. That was the plan anyways. It was a good 40 miles or more, quite a hike, but we were young and strong and fearless and maybe a bit in denial, which is nicer than saying we were dumb. Oh man, the first few miles carrying a big pack always eats a man alive. After a while, you get your second wind and it slacks off, but the start is always hard. It takes a while for your blood to get oxygenated, but at first it was easy, flat going as we circled the lake and we met a few people who would all say hello and wanted to know where we were going. But one fellow we met on the trail left a bad taste in my mouth. He kind of took the wind out of my sails, though he didn't seem to bother Rowdy any. He was just a regular looking sort of fellow maybe in his forties, kind of shaggy, with a short beard and longish hair, wearing a small pack and looking like he'd been out enough to know how to take care of himself. When we met him on the trail, he didn't even bother to say hello. He just stopped and started kind of lecturing us with concern. Look, boys, he said, you be real careful out there. As you probably know, there's been some big fires up here in the last few years, and you're going to be hiking through lots of snags, you know, standing dead trees. They're very dangerous, and it takes almost nothing to knock one down. I had a couple almost come down on top of me out on the trail just today. Try not to put your tents anywhere near them, as a night breeze will push them down right on top of you. We thanked him for his advice and started back up the trail, but he wasn't done. It's what he said next that left me feeling unsettled. And when you hear wood knockers, get the hell out. You're going smack into their territory and you wouldn't be the first ones to just disappear out there. Trust me on this one, kids. I stopped and turned, watching the hikers start back down the trail, seeming intent on making good time out. I just stood there for a while, wondering what he meant. Finally, Rowdy kind of hit my shoulder, saying, come on, let's get going, but I just stood there. I felt weird all of a sudden. The first time ever in my life, I questioned what I was doing. Rowdy said, woodknockers are just a myth. If they existed, we would have seen them by now, because we've been living in their supposed territory all summer. Come on, don't let him scare you. Let's go. He's full of it. We continued on up the trail, but I was now more wary. Woodknockers. Bigfoot. There had been rumors of them in the flat tops for years. In fact, 
I remembered a story my uncle told about being out with some hunting clients, sitting around a campfire, and hearing the most ungodly scream that went on and on all night. After that, my uncle wouldn't go alone out in the mountains, even though he'd never actually seen anything remotely like a Bigfoot. He also knew some people who had come up on the other side of the mountains over by Deep Creek and found a weird assortment of clothes tossed around the creek. As they were standing there trying to figure it out, they saw a huge dark figure come from the thick forest and just stand there, and they left immediately. These were the stories I conveniently forgot when backpacking with Rowdy. Until meeting the hiker, that was. But we hadn't been in the flat tops until now. Suddenly, my pack felt even heavier than before. I kind of thought for a moment about my mom's good crockpot stew and wondered if she'd made any lately. I hadn't thought about anything homey since we'd started our wild man lifestyle that spring. We carried on, right on up the trail and up the mountain. I swear, this was our last trip in and should have been the easiest because I was in top shape after a summer of backpacking, but it seemed harder and harder the further we got. I finally mentioned it to Rowdy. He answered, It's just because you're feeling uncertain from what that hippie-looking dude told you. That's all. You have to rekindle the charge. I didn't say much and just followed Rowdy on upwards. I was thinking that a big crate of dynamite would be about the right charge to get me rekindled. Not much else would have any effect. We found a nice place to camp for the night in a beautiful clearing by a little pond, surrounded by old, narrow-leaf cottonwood trees, nary a snag in sight. I was so tired I slept like a rock, if rocks can sleep, and Bigfoot never crossed my mind. The next day, I was re-energized, and so was Rowdy. Our old enthusiasm was back, and we made good time hiking up a long drainage and finding a way onto the top of a huge mesa. The views were awesome. The top of the huge mesa. Oh, the views were awesome. We decided to try and make good time and get back down on the other side before dark, which we managed to do with a lot of effort. We both slept like babies that night, forgetting all about the woodknockers. The next day, our third day in, we climbed up another drainage, which was tough going as there weren't many animal trails and we had to fight our way through scrub oak underbrush. When we got to the top, we could see what looked to be the leading edge of a storm way out far to the west and I can't say this made either of us very happy. We were now in the heart of the flat tops wilderness. Our mountain man romanticism was quickly settling into reality of pure physical survival in the high mountains. We were at 10,000 feet. Once again, we made good time. Unlike our previous trips, we both now felt a sense of urgency. I could tell the barometric pressure was dropping. I'd been out enough to recognize how the dropping pressure affected me, and this felt like a big one coming. Why we didn't just turn around when we saw the storm coming in, I'll never know. The next day, our fourth, we woke to overcast skies and a sense of foreboding. Gray thendrils of clouds melted around the mountain, tops above us. We broke camp with an even greater sense of urgency. It really felt like snow was coming. There was this cold calmness to the air that usually precedes a big snowfall, and the air smelled different, like it always does before a big storm. We packed up again, took a few minutes to study our topography maps, then headed out. We needed to make good time as we had many miles to go before we were even vaguely near civilization. I was beginning to wish I'd listened to my uncle. The day wore on as we slogged along. Finally, it was getting late, so we started looking for a place to set up camp. Just like the hiker has said, we were now in a huge snag forest, and tall dead pines stood all around like ghostly sentinels. As darkness fell, their dead bark took on an eerie aspect from the setting sun, muted behind the thick clouds. 
We looked and looked, but couldn't find anywhere to camp where there weren't snags. It was as close to dark as we could get and still see to set up our tents, and we had to stop. I was exhausted, but Rowdy acted like he could hike all night. In fact, he suggested we do just that, since he didn't want to camp in the snags. In a former lifetime, the one before I met the shaggy hiker by the Trapper's Lake, I might have agreed to do that, but not now. I was just too tired and on edge, and I didn't want to chance getting lost. I told Rowdy we'd just have to take our chances with dying from deadfall. He said it was an interesting play on words, then reluctantly took off his pack. We set up the tents in a thinner part of the forest, but we were still surrounded by dead pines. Some stood 30 or 40 feet tall. We could see where a number had already fallen. I pretty much collapsed into my sleeping bag, so tired I didn't even want dinner. I don't remember much, except waking once to the eerie sound of trees creaking and seeing long shadows across my tent. I awoke at dawn to a distinct sound that sounded like a tree crashing to the ground, then went back to sleep. It wasn't until Rowdy woke me with a cup of coffee that I really came around. I drank it while still in my bag, then mustered the energy to get up. It was cold and I could see my breath. Rowdy already had his tent down and pack ready, though it was still early. He seemed unusually quiet and eager to get going. He made me more hot coffee and some hot oatmeal while I broke camp. It was now totally gray and dreary, speaking to the leading edge of this huge storm. What's up, bud? I asked. Rowdy usually lounged around camp until I made the push to go. Nothing, just feeling like we need to get going. Anything in particular? The weather, among other things, he answered. He pointed to a dusting of fresh snow on the cliffs above us. I asked, what other things? Rowdy was quiet for a while, then asked, didn't you hear the noises last night? I heard the snags creaking, that's all. Wood knocking, he replied. Holy crap, I said, are you sure? Yep, for a long time. They got closer and closer. There were at least three of them, all in different directions. I'm thinking we need to turn around and go back now. What? We're way over halfway there now, I replied. Yeah, but we know the way back. The way forward is unknown. We can make better time if we turn around. Rowdy was scared, and so was I, but we needed to push forward. Not turn around, especially with this storm. We were only a day or two at the most from our destination. I answered, You're wanting the security of the known, but we're not that far out now. We have to go forward. If we go back, we'll run out of supplies, and we'd have to keep really close bearings as things always look different when you're hiking the opposite direction. We can't make enough faster time to justify it. We both sat there a while, uncertain of what to do. It now started to drizzle a cold rain that felt like ice. Rowdy added, If we go forward, we still have to cross the Devil's Causeway, though we'll come out sooner, but the causeway will be a real bear if it's snow or ice covered. It's scary enough when it's dry. The Devil's Causeway was part of the Chinese Wall, a huge volcanic dike that we would have to hike across at an altitude of almost 12,000 feet. The Chinese wall was about 200 feet wide, but the Devil's Causeway portion was very exposed and narrow, a mere 3 feet across for about 20 feet and 400 sheer feet down on either side. We had both hiked it from the other side when we were in high school. It was very rocky and difficult under the best conditions, and we'd seen seasoned hikers cower and turn around because of the exposure. The views were like being in an airplane. Of course, there would be no views in this storm. I suspected we would be in full-out blizzard by the time we got to the Chinese wall, and I knew Rowdy suspected the same, but neither of us said a word. We both stood, put on our packs, and started down the trail going forward. It was now sleeting and cold, and the trail was slippery. We had good coats, but we both felt chilled to the bone from the damp. 
After a couple of hours, we stopped to make hot chocolate. As we sat there, boiling water on our little backpacking stoves, I heard it, wood knocking, just like Rowdy had said, and not so far away. I felt even more chilled. The hiker's words, you wouldn't be the first ones to just disappear out there, kept running through my mind. Rowdy had heard it also. We quickly drank the hot chocolate and headed out, our walking gait turning into a half jog even though it was wet and slick. We found some large sticks and used them to keep our balance. Soon it was dusk. We'd made good time and had to be close to the Chinese wall. The wet drizzle was now turning into snow, and I had another first in my life. For the first time, I thought I could die out there in the wilderness. It occurred to me how truly easy it would be, which I think fueled some sort of survival instinct as I told Rowdy we were going to try our hands at night hiking and hope we didn't get lost. He agreed it was a swell idea. We'd hike by headlamp until we got to the Chinese wall, then regroup. Pure insanity, but we were both chilled to the bone at the thought of spending a night in camp surrounded by wood knockers. We picked up the pace, but as it became dark, we stopped long enough to eat a hot dinner. We both knew it was a smart thing to do, as our bodies needed fuel and warmth to continue on. I could see both of us wandering lost hypothermic in the blizzard, and it seemed to be a prophetic vision at this point. As we sat there, eating freeze-dried stew and drinking hot tea, the wind picked up and the forest began to creak. We were in more snags and the storm was just moving in full brunt. Just then, what sounded like a huge tree came crashing to the ground not more than 20 feet from us. So close, we were both barraged by small branches that snapped off from the impact. Time to go. We slogged on in the dark, following somewhat of a trail through the tall grasses and trees, and finally, at what I guessed to be 2 a.m., we reached some rocky rubble, what I suspected to be the beginning of a talus slope. If so, this was the trail up the Chinese wall and would soon become a steep and treacherous rocky climb. We had to stop. We couldn't navigate this in the dark and we needed to rest. We were both exhausted. We were at the edge of another snag forest, so we began collecting wood. We would try to rest and get warm around a big fire. It was still sleeting and thus difficult to find dry wood, but we knew if we got the fire going hot enough, even damp wood would burn. We soon had a huge pile of wood from the nearby forest, enough to build a big bonfire. We didn't even bother to put up our tents, but instead draped them over us to keep us dry, laying our sleeping bags next to the fire, which raged and helped warm us up. We decided to take turns keeping the fire going, as the last thing we wanted was for it to go out. I knew Rowdy was exhausted, so I offered to stand first watch. I also figured the odds were better of the fire being fed if I stayed up and let him sleep as I didn't trust him to stay awake. To make a long story short, I fell asleep myself and the fire went out. I awoke sometime later with a start, as something had made my instincts kick in. I lay there, very still, and could soon hear a large animal pacing back and forth in the darkness, not far away, crashing through the brush and snapping sticks. It seemed unhappy that we were here. Just then, something whizzed by my head, which then crashed into the grasses behind us. I jumped up and quickly got the fire going again. The woodknockers had followed us. I knew it was them. What else could throw something like that? Whoosh! Another snag came flying through the air, a big one. It almost landed in the fire. I started yelling and cussing, both from fright and anger. We'd finally almost made it out, and now these creatures were going to kill us. Death by deadfall, except it didn't fall. No one would believe it. Death by snag missile? What a way to go. Now, Rowdy was next to the fire, scared to death, chilled and teeth chattering. Wham! Another tree came in, but not quite as close. These creatures must be huge and strong to throw something like a snag. The thought of all this made me want to start crying. All the stress and physical exhaustion of the past days had taken their toll. 
I started yelling again at the top of my lungs. I had no idea what time of night it was, but dawn couldn't be too far off. All of a sudden, what I heard made my teeth start chattering along with Rowdy's. It was a blood-curdling scream like nothing on this planet. It sounded angry and like it wanted to kill us. And it went on and on, a volume that defied all reason, echoing through the cliffs and on and on into a deep thickness of the forest behind us. I knew we were dead then and there. In fact, I took Rowdy and put my arm around his shoulders. I could feel his chest heaving and I knew he was silently sobbing. I told him, whatever happens, bro, we're going to get through this. You watch. We're sons of guns and we're survivors. What I really wanted to say was goodbye, see you on the other side, but I didn't want to make him worse. The screaming had dissolved just like a huge ocean wave slams the shore and gradually dissipates. But the weird feeling it left behind really messed with my mind. I just couldn't believe this was happening. We have to go now, I told Rowdy. Let's leave the fire burning as a decoy and see if we can slip away. It's got to be near dawn. If we can get across the Chinese wall, maybe they'll leave us alone. Why would that matter? Rowdy asked. Territory, I answered. Although I didn't believe it myself. Besides, better to die fighting than huddled by a fire. We banked the fire as high as we could, grabbed our packs, and slipped off. Snow sizzled into the fire behind us. It was really starting to come down now. I seriously doubted we could get out, even without wood knockers, to distract us. We stopped, and I shone my light ahead. The falling snow made it difficult to tell, but I had been right. We were at the base of the Chinese wall, the beginning of a talus slope that I knew was steep and unstable. It would be twice as tricky with snow on it. We started climbing, wondering if the wood knockers were behind. I knew they were. We made our way upwards as dawn broke. I was glad to see light, as I knew that even if we could get up the talus slope, traveling the, the actual Chinese wall in the dark would be dangerous. As one had to stay in the middle, it was a sheer drop off either side, although wide, but when it narrowed to a mere three feet at the Devil's Causeway, it would be pure suicide in the dark and ice. It was now snowing hard, and the wind whipped it into swirling clouds, howling, and I sometimes thought I could hear a wood knocker scream through it. Visibility was poor in the dawning light, but we climbed up and up until we reached the top, and it began to level out. We were now on the actual Chinese wall. We stopped to catch our breaths and knock the snow off our packs, but we didn't stop for long. Rowdy, I whispered, there's something coming up behind us. Gotta go fast now. I grabbed his arm and pulled him along, half running, half slipping. I could hear footsteps behind us, a heavy pounding sound like something big. When the wind quit whistling and whipping our coats long enough to hear anything, I was terrified. We both ran as fast as we could, sliding along, and fortunately, we could now see well enough to stay in the middle of the wall. I didn't dare turn around to see what seemed to be rapidly catching up to us. Now we were at the narrow nightmare called the Devil's Causeway. Rowdy stopped, frozen in fear. The 20-foot catwalk was covered with several inches of snow. Rubby rocks made the going hazardous enough without adding snow, and the visibility was poor, but we could still see the sheer drop off on both sides. The wind seemed to be worse, and I figured it was because of the narrowness here. I was coming straight up from either side and meeting in the middle. I now began to think the wind was more of a danger to us than the snow, as it would mess with our balance and whip us right off. Go, Rowdy, go, I screamed. I had now turned around just enough to see something huge and black behind us, although I couldn't make it out what it was because of the blinding snow. But Rowdy stood frozen. We could now hear the wood knockers making grunting noises, and this was quickly gaining on us. We had to act fast. Ditch your pack, I screamed into the wind, throwing my heavy pack into the abyss below. Rowdy quickly did the same as he knew it would make 
crossing the causeway easier. We might regret not having our survival gear, but not as much as we would regret falling. I hooked my arm through Rowdy's, and we quickly yet deliberately walked across, not daring to look down. At one point, I could feel myself starting to slip, but he grabbed me, and I miraculously recovered. It was the longest 20 feet of my life. The wind nearly blew us off, but I think we had more stability because we were hanging on to each other for dear life. Finally, we were across. I turned, scared to death at what I knew I would see, then stunned by what I actually did see. Something big was coming across the causeway, no more than 30 feet from us. Rowdy saw it and began yelling something unintelligible, we should have both started running, but we were frozen in fear, literally. It was hard to make out its features through the thick snowfall, but we both knew it was a woodknocker, a Bigfoot. The creature hadn't gone more than a few feet across when an especially strong gust of wind hit it, and it started to lose its footing. We watched in horror as it balanced for a moment, and then, seemingly in slow motion, began falling off the side, its last moments a horrible grasping at the rocks with its long forearms flailing. It let out a long, terrifying scream as it fell, and to think, it takes my breath away even to this day. And what happened next, I couldn't also believe. We heard gunshots. Someone was on the Chinese wall not far ahead of us, shooting what sounded like a rifle. The shots popped and the sound echoed back and forth. Someone was nearby. Rowdy and I both started yelling at the top of our lungs. We yelled and yelled until we thought we would go hoarse. We yelled as we hightailed it down the far side of the Chinese wall. We wanted whoever it was to find us. We soon saw two figures through the wind-whipped snow. It was now a full-on blizzard. How they found us, I'll never know. But... It was my Uncle Joe and Rowdy's stepdad. They'd come looking for us. They had a base camp set up, not too far away, complete with horses and food. They'd hoped to meet us on our way out and came as soon as my uncle had realized what was really coming in weather-wise. He fortunately helped us plot our route, so had an idea of where we would be. He had watched the forecast like a hawk, and when he realized a huge storm was coming in, he knew we would need help. We were never happier to see other human beings. We returned to the camp and got warmed up, ate a meal, then headed out on horses, making good time. Riding never felt so good, even though I was sore for a few days afterward. We later found out the high flat tops got six feet of snow from that storm. Our mountain man days were over forever. It was a few years later that Rowdy and I decided to get my uncle to ride in with us to check it all out. He brought horses, and we came in from Yampa side along with the base of the Chinese wall, right to where we could look up and see the Devil's Causeway. Even though it was a warm summer day, I could still feel the chill of the early morning high hype up there in the blizzard, watching the woodknocker scream as it fell. I found only one thing from our packs, and that was a tin cup I had carried that said Lone Joe Outfitting. There was otherwise no trace of anything. I knew we'd thrown our packs off that side, so it was kind of weird. We looked around a bit for bones, but never found any. It seems we all got the creeps at the same time because everyone decided to turn around and go back instead of having the picnic lunch we'd brought along. We rode back and loaded up the horses and had a nice dinner at the Antler Bar in Yampa, then went back to Meeker. I hope you enjoyed those stories. If you did, be sure to hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I post new videos every Thursday, so if you hit that notification bell, you'll be notified when they go live. Again, thank you so much for watching this video, and until next time, bye!